welcome to Garden Hour tonight. We are here to share information about all things yards and gardens and to answer questions that you may have. I'm Rhoda Burroughs and I will be your host tonight. Our panelists tonight are Amanda Bachman, SDSU Extension Pesticide Education and Urban Entomology Specialist. Amanda, I believe you have some guidance for us on when and how to use pesticides. Yeah, I'm going to be going over some things about safer pesticide use and storage around the home and a quick insect update at the end. Sounds great. And uh, other panelists tonight are John Ball, SDSU Extension Forestry Specialist and South Dakota Forest Health Specialist. John, what's up in the woody plant world tonight? Well, and tonight we're going to talk about emerald ash borer. We passed the threshold, it's emerged, so that little pest, which fortunately is in a small part of the state, is out flying. So I'll chat about that as well as a couple of other problems that are beginning to pop up. Sounds good. And I, I am Rhoda Burroughs, SDSU Extension Horticulture Specialist. And I am going to share with you some questions that were sent in this week on tomatoes and grapes. If you do have questions throughout the uh, presentations, I encourage you to use the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen, um, or that may vary depending on whether you're using a computer, tablet, or phone, the location of that, uh, to enter your question. You can use that at any time. You can also use the chat. Uh, if you use the Q&A, it gives us a little extra ability to make notes on it. So with that, I will turn it over to Amanda. All right, thank you, Rhoda. So yeah, I'm gonna talk about the pesticide education side of my job and what folks can do with home and garden chemicals. If you're like me, perhaps you purchased a home or inherited um, some chemicals that are maybe hanging out in the garage and you don't know what to do with them. And so we'll talk about that. But if you've got a you know, yard or garden problem and you picked up something at the big box store and you wanna know how to handle it, that's what we're gonna start out with. And the, the big thing that we always say when talking about pesticides is to read and follow the label instructions. If I had a dollar for every time I said that during the course of my job duties, I wouldn't have to work here anymore. Um, but despite saying that over and over again, people still kind of skim those labels or maybe just take them as, you know, optional advice instead of an actual like legally binding document. So when people are asking me what they can use for a certain situation, one of my first pieces of advice is to read that label when you're in the store with the product. And if there's something on that label that you are unwilling or unable to do, be it about what kind of protective clothing to wear when using the product or how to store or dispose of the product, put that product back on the shelf and make a different choice or find a different solution to your problem. So reading that label is super, super critical. And I know those labels can have some really fine print on it. And sometimes on those jugs, it's sort of like some of the medication bottles where you peel the label off and it accordions out and you need a magnifying glass to read all the fine print. Those labels can also usually be found online in a PDF form. So if you're having trouble reading the label on a product that you have, go ahead and do a quick Google search, find the product man manufacturer um, or the EPA website, and you may actually be able to find a copy of that label that has some larger print that's easier to use. The next thing is to always store those products according to their label directions. And just a quick note that there are a lot of things in our homes and garages that are actually pesticides. A lot of people don't realize that things like bleach actually have an EPA registration number, same as your weed killer or um, your you know, ants or wasps wasp spray. So it's not just things that, you know, we're using for 
garden pest problems, there are other household chemicals that actually do fall under the umbrella of a pesticide and are regulated by the same things that, you know, we think about more with, you know, spraying for, you know, wasps or spraying for dandelions. So when you're storing these chemicals, make sure that you're keeping them away from kids and pets, um, especially also when you're making applications. Make sure to read that label and follow the instructions for how long you have to wait before you can re-enter a treated area. You also want to avoid extreme temperature changes. These temperature swings can um, negatively impact the um, sort of the functionality of that product and also its stability. So it can cause it to sort of break down and not be as effective. Um, and you know, then it's not gonna work as well for you. So in my case, I totally have some vintage herbicide that is in my garage from the previous owner, which at this point is like nine years ago. I need to take it to have it disposed of. And we'll talk about some ways that you can do that uh, later on in this presentation. So avoid those extreme temperature changes. And then always, always, always keep those chemicals in their original containers. I cannot stress the safety tip enough. It's not even a tip, it is like a mandate, a safety mandate. Keep those products in their original containers. When I'm talking to a more commercial pesticide applicator audience, we talk about a product called Paraquat, which you may or may not know, it's an herbicide and it's a restricted use herbicide which means that you do have to be a licensed pesticide applicator in order to access it. And one of the reasons that it's restricted use is that when it is ingested, even in teeny tiny amounts, it is almost 100%, like it's very, very fatal. Um, so it's a very risky product uh, when it comes to human sort of well-being. Um, and so that's why it's restricted as far as who can get it. The things that you can get over the counter at your big box stores, you know, don't usually have that skull and crossbones on the label, but it's still not something that you want to put into a, you know, soda bottle or a milk jug or something else to mix and or store. You want to keep it in that original container so it is still attached to its original label. When people sort of start putting things in other, you know, beverage containers, some of those um, chemicals can have the same sort of bright colors as some of our beverages, like, you know, our, our various like fruit drinks and soft drinks. And that can be really enticing to small children. So make sure that you're keeping those products stored in their original containers. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, when it's time to dispose of unused or unusable products, do that according to local requ requirements and same deal with empty containers. Not every trash hauler is going to accept uh, used pesticide containers for pickup. Also on pesticide bottles, there will be instructions on how to dispose of the container. Usually that involves triple rinsing the container before um, offering it up for recycling or disposal. In some of our larger South Dakota metro areas, especially thinking about you folks in the Sioux Falls region, um, you may have some more options for local disposal because you've got a sort of larger municipal household hazardous waste program. Those of us in some of the more hinterlandy areas of South Dakota don't have um, quite as many options for disposal. And with products that are still usable, you know, you can use them on labeled sites and, you know, get rid of things that way. My vintage Roundup, I could probably, you know, use to try to kill some weeds in my driveway if I was so inclined. But at this point, it's been through nine South Dakota winters of temperature swings. So I don't even know if it's still a liquid at this point. Um, in South Dakota, our Department of Ag and Natural Resources does do um, a pesticide container recycling program and an unusable pesticide collection program. Uh, for folks that may have, you know, acreages and larger volumes of containers to recycle, uh, during the summer they actually go around and do one collection date per county, usually starting in about mid-July. And so that's something you can keep an eye out for if you've got a lot of containers that you want to recycle. It's a really cool program. Um, it's free to the users, um, the, you know, South Dakota Department of Ag and Natural Resources. They, you know, have a contract to pay for the recycling and then those products get recycled into plastic things that are not going to be 
in the food system. So things like, uh, you know, parking lot, you know, bumpers or that kind of stuff. So the, the plastics do get recycled instead of um, put in a landfill. So that's a pretty cool program. And then, like I said, if you've got some local waste disposal services, you might have a household hazardous waste collection option. And the Department of Ag and Natural Resources, their unusable pesticide collection program, usually you have to bring those products to peer, um, but you can call them and see if they're gonna be in your area to pick up um, unusable pesticides. In South Dakota, uh, burning containers is illegal. So that's part of the reason why we have the recycling program. So if you're out in the country, please don't burn pesticide containers for many reasons, not the least of which is, you know, burning plastic is, you know, kind of a pollutant, but also you don't know what kind of residue is in those containers and then you end up inhaling it and that's not great for anybody. And like I said about keeping products with their original label and container, when you're storing products in other containers like you know soda bottles or milk jugs, that's how we can end up with cases of accidental ingestion. And I'll throw some you know links and phone numbers in the chat here um, during our next presentation for the po poison control um, poison control center and also for Knapsack. Um, a National Pesticide Safety Education Center that has some great resources on um, pesticide safety and things that are geared towards more of a homeowner audience. Um, but yeah, the, the big thing is read the label. And one of the things we talked about last week was, you know, the discussion of the herbicide uh, glyphosate, which a lot of people sort of conflate glyphosate, which is a chemical name, with Roundup, which is a trade name. And so now the company that owns Roundup they're keeping that trade name of Roundup, but they're tagging it onto some different chemical um, sort of recipes and some different chemical names. So as Paul Johnson said during his presentation, and as we mentioned last week, if you see a product that has, you know, Roundup in big, you know, big letters on the bottle, that's the trade name. And that does not mean that the product in there actually is glyphosate as the active ingredient. So you still have to read the fine print on the label and see what active ingredient is actually in there. You know, it's sort of like the, the Kleenex facial tissue thing or like Xerox copy machine. Um, you know, Roundup has really been um, conflated with glyphosate over the years and that's gonna be a hard association to break. So the thing that I want everyone to take away from this tonight is to read the label, follow the label instructions. And if you have questions about how to use a pesticide, how to, um, how to you know, use PPE, what kind of PPE you need. If you need help interpreting the label, you know, that's one of the things that we're here for in extension is to you know, offer some, some advice on that and to help you, you know, kind of find some resources so that you can use the products um, at a reduced risk to yourself and you know, to the environment and you know, people and pets around you. So I will take a real quick look at the chat here, ah, question, what should you do with a pesticide container so old that you can't read the label? So in that case, if the container is empty, you could offer it up for recycling um, if there's you know, no residue or anything in it. Um, if there's still like residue or product in it, that would be an unusable pesticide collection situation. And you would wanna have that, have the product inside of it, just, you know, unusable pesticide collection. Um, and then afterwards, you may be able to triple, triple rinse and offer that up for recycling. But yeah, we've, I've heard stories of people who have purchased, you know, acreages that had outbuildings, they get into the outbuildings and realize that there's like containers of DDT or other things that the label has been revoked by the EPA. And so there's no legal way to use the product to get rid of it. And they have to have it, you know, unusable pesticide collection in order to get rid of it safely. and just took a quick look at the Q&A and that is not a Q&A for me. So I will sort of end the pesticide safety portion of this and give you guys a real quick, um, the one sort of insect that I'm keeping an eye out for this week are the June beetles. I've had reports from some of my colleagues in the Southern part of the state, like South of Mitchell, that the June beetles or June bugs are starting to emerge. And despite the name June bug, these are actually a beetle. So order Coleoptera, they've got that crunchy 
a really crunchy exoskeleton, that hardened first pair of wings, the hardened elytra. And these are brown beetles, you know, about an inch-ish big, and they're not very good flyers. They have their little sort of gangly legs, and it's a lot of work to haul that kind of mass around on just, you know, one pair of membranous wings. If you start turning on your back porch light after dark, you may notice the June beetles, you know, pinging off your screen or maybe piling up underneath those lights. But these are going to be starting to fly. And I think that John's maybe going to touch on some of the defoliation damage that the adults can do. Um, but as far as management, these guys, um, they are grubs in the soil for most of their life. Um, and that's really the life stage that we try to target with treatment. And the time for treating grubs in lawns is going to be later in July and early August. So for right now, um, you may just be picking them out of your hair as they fly into you. Um, but there's not a ton that we can do right now for management of June beetles. But just know that they're going to start flying. And I know there's some of my friends that have dogs. Um, you know, the dogs like to eat the June beetle snacks on their walks. So sort of the first like mass emergence insect of the summer. So that is all that I have. I will stop sharing and turn it back over to Rhoda or John. We're going to John yep. next. <laughs> I know we talked about this. <laughs> and let's see if I got this going. Yeah, there we go. And uh, yeah, and, and thanks for that comment on the June bugs. Um, you know, I'm, I'm starting to get some calls too. And, and of course, you and I chatted about it. But the, the one that I get is people say something's feeding on the leaves of my ash tree, for example, it's one they like, but I never see anything out there. And as Amanda pointed out, these are night flyers. So unless you have a yard light on or you wander around at 2 a.m. in the morning, you're not likely to see them until the morning time where they are, as she mentioned, kind of piled up. Uh, gas stations are a good place to find them because they tend to have lighting uh, 24 hours. And sometimes you'll notice too, and I've seen this in past years, that you'll see some defoliated trees, the leaves are chewed, they, they don't eat neatly, I guess is a good way to say it. And you'll find all these little holes that look like Swiss cheese in the ground beneath the trees. And that's where the adults have emerged. So I don't know how bad of a problem it's going to be this year. And some years we get a couple of calls. But uh, for me, it started about a week ago. And, and as Amanda pointed out, it's really at the southern end of the state. And it'll move its way north. The, uh, the other thing you don't like about these is if you're ever riding your motorcycle at night and you hit one of these with your throat, you will know it. Uh, it hurts. So anyway, there's a lot of reasons not to like June bugs. Well, anyway, uh, what am I chatting about tonight? Well, my where are we at for growing degree days? And Aberdeen is still always lagging though it's starting to catch up and Rapid City is kind of slowing down a little bit more. Sioux Falls, we passed the 550 uh, growing degree day threshold. And that's a threshold for two, two events. First of all, black locusts are in bloom. You'll find those in Rapid City, uh, excuse me, uh, Mitchell, uh, De uh, Del Rapids, Sioux Falls, Yankton and such. And not only do they have incredibly attractive flowers, these beautiful white flowers that kind of hang, but the flowers are very fragrant. And uh, if one's in your neighborhood, you'll absolutely know it. So for about a week, it's a wonderful tree to have. But that bloom period coincides with the emergence of emerald ash borer. Now, emerald ash borer doesn't emerge all at once. You can see in this picture, the one that looks like a ghost emerald ash borer, white with the dark eye patches, uh, that one will probably, well, would have been emerging about three weeks from now. And we do have some that don't emerge until uh, mid-July. Uh, but as you can see from this picture too, we're already getting some that are beginning to emerge. And so our, our pioneer beetles, if you will, start usually about June 1st, so it's just about on schedule, about 550 degree days. And then emergence will peak. In other words, we'll have about half of them have already flown 
uh, about the third week of June when little leaf lindens in it bloom. And then virtually all of them that are going to fly this year are flying uh, by about mid-July when we have hydrangeas in bloom, about uh, 1,200 growing degree days. So they're right on schedule doing better than most airlines right now. And in fact, you can see there's one beginning to emerge, just kind of popping out of the tree as an adult. Remember to spend the winter in the larval stage, pupate in the spring, and then in a pre-cut hole, will actually exit. It takes them about 45 minutes, surprisingly, to fully emerge. And during that time period, they're very vulnerable for predation by a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of birds, but a lot of them managed to, uh, to make it. And there's a picture of an adult, and, Unfortunately, not in complete focus. They tend to zip off very quickly. You'll find them on the south sides of trees if you find them at all. Uh, most growlis insects, that's the genus of insects, really do a good job of hiding. They're generally up high in the canopy of the tree until the tree is almost completely dead. They do like the uh, sunny sides of trees. And uh, one of the interesting things is this insect likes days that you like, about 70 to 80 degrees, sunny, no wind, and no humidity. It's the perfect day for you is the perfect day for this insect. And those are the days that you'll find it flying most often. And they fly for about three weeks, some, some four weeks. Mom has to feed on leaves for about a week or so before she begins laying eggs. And that takes about another week. Uh, so we've got about two more weeks before egg laying starts. And then it takes about a week for those eggs to hatch. So we're not likely to see larvae uh, until about third week of June. So if you live in Minnehaha or Lincoln County, where we know we have confirmed infestations, if you live in those counties and you have an ash tree you really like, and you've not gotten around to having it treated yet, you might wanna call a commercial company and get on their list to get it injected as soon as possible. Because injections done now gets the chemical up into the leaves, you'll kill mom before she lays eggs. And if one happens to lay eggs on that tree without feeding on the leaves, once that egg hatches, the larvae are gonna be very, very tiny and are going to be killed before they do any damage to the tree. Yes, you can inject the trees throughout the growing season, but the later you inject them, the more damage that the larvae are going to do before you finally kill them. It takes a little bit more pesticide uh, to do it. You know, and, and I loved Amanda's talk there, and, and I want to point out one other thing, and she might uh, chime in on it later on tonight, and that is beware of the internet. Uh, I find homeowners that somehow are able to get a hold of restricted use pesticides. And no, you're not allowed to use those, but that's actually surprisingly a common question. Well, I got this. Well, well, homeowners aren't allowed to use it. Well, let's say I got this. I always like that. Well, okay, let's just say, I got this. how would I apply it? No, if you don't know how to apply it, you don't have the equipment, you shouldn't be applying it. So not only read and follow label directions, but the first thing, make sure it's one you can legally apply that it's not a restricted use pesticide, that um, you have to have a commercial applicator's license in, in which to do so. Um, but uh, this is definitely an insect that you want to pay someone to come out and treat rather than do it yourself because they have a better array of, of chemicals and delivery systems to, uh, to treat your trees. This, I, I wanted to point this out tonight because we do have a lot of people, particularly in the Southeast, quite frankly, throughout the entire state, that are really looking a little closer at their ash trees because you know emerald ash is going to be showing up somewhere everywhere in the state within about 20 years and due to that storm we had a couple of weeks ago we've had a lot of out-of-state tree companies come in and start removing trees and a lot of them have actually been very helpful in that They've told homeowners, you know, we're looking at that ash tree in your yard and we think it has emerald ash borer. You may want to call someone. And I, and I really appreciate it. They're not saying, hey, we need to take it down or that. They're not trying to make a sale. They spotted something or just alerting the homeowner why they're out there cutting down the ash, excuse me, the uh, spruce tree that fell during the storm. Well, the thing that a lot of people key on is blonding. And this is a picture of it where that outer layer of bark has been stripped away. And that lighter colored bark is beneath it. And we call that blonding. Now, 
blonding is is a uh, symptom we do associate with emerald ash borer because woodpeckers are very good at finding emerald ash borer. Uh, they find them before we do. Uh, they listen for them and they'll go up and down the trunks of trees uh, listening for them. And as they're doing so, they're literally knocking that outer layer of bark off, which actually is fairly easy to break away. Now, just because you see blonding, though, in an ash tree doesn't mean that that was caused by woodpeckers looking for emerald ash borer. Squirrels will do this as well. And it's something we've always seen, but you know, in the past, before we knew about emerald ash borer, no one really gave it much of a thought. So a lot of the companies that have been out there, you know, they're up in Watertown or so on, where we don't have a confirmed population of emerald ash borer. And someone will say, well, you know what, you might want to have your tree checked. I, I think it is emerald ash borer because of that blonding. And I'll go out and look at it and I'll say, no, that was just squirrels. What you want to look for, and, and hopefully you can see this on your computer screens, do you notice there's holes in that blonding? And, and I'll show you a close-up of it. See that? That's what you want to notice. That's not caused by a squirrel. That is a woodpecker. So if you just see blonding in the upper canopy of an ash tree, uh, that really doesn't mean a lot. Squirrels could do that as well as a number of other factors. But if you look at that blonding and you see these holes about pencil size going in, and a lot of them, well, those are going to be woodpecker drills. And then we're at about a 95% chance of similar ash borer. Now, notice I didn't say 100% because occasionally some of our native ash borers, and we have native ash borers, we've always had them. Sometimes they'll live just beneath the bark for a short time period. And when they're just beneath the bark, woodpeckers can get them very easily. Um, uh, pier, for example, I looked at a tree there and you would have swore it was emerald ash borer. The tree was blonded and you pulled the bark away and you could see some galleries with a uh, little sawdust in them, which is very characteristic of emerald ash borer. But it was our native banded ash borer. And for a while, they were just beneath the bark. So woodpeckers were after them as well. So, but I'd still say, you find the blonding and you find the woodpecker drills in it, uh, that's definitely something that, and if you're out of Lincoln and Minneapolis County, that's definitely something I'd want to come out and take a look at uh, because you probably most likely have found a nether emerald ash borer infestation. Well, a lot of you are finding this right now. Oh my gosh, am I getting pictures? People are going out and say, I found this on my tree. What do I do? Ah, don't worry about it. Some people are kind of concerned with their kids. That unless the kids are going to eat this stuff, uh, which they shouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be too concerned about it. But if you were an apple tree, I'd be very concerned about it because this is cedar apple rust on the cedars, what we often call cedars, the junipers. And right now, at this time of year, usually end of May, early June, we get a little moisture, we get some warm weather, and these woody galls that uh, are on the junipers will open up and you'll have these bright orange telia horns. And these are going to release spores that will now go to infect the apples and crab apples. And then midsummer, you're going to find a similar pattern on the underside of the apple or crab apple leaves with these little kind of hairs coming out of them. And those are going to produce spores that then go back and infect the cedar trees. Now, cedar apple rust does not cause much problem to our junipers or cedars. Occasionally, a gull will get so large it'll actually girdle a twig or a branch, but that's actually fairly rare. The real problem to this rust disease is what it could do to apples and crab apples. Uh, first of all, the leaves will look blotchy and they aren't going to look very pleasant, but they're also going to drop prematurely uh, before they've really done their, their job for the year. Occasionally, they can actually end up infecting the fruit as well, though I don't see that very much. We do have a lot of apples and crab apples that have a high resistance to cedar apple rust. So not every apple and crab apple will end up with the disease. But when you start seeing these telia horns forming, that's a clue that if you've got a tree that's susceptible and a tree that has had cedar apple rust in the past, you should be getting those sprays on. In fact, uh, you should have started already. 
uh, to get the sprays on to protect the leaves and the developing fruit from becoming infected. I'll chime in again with uh, Amanda's excellent discussion on pesticides, read and follow label directions. Uh, quite often people run out and say, well, I've, I've got a fungicide, I'll use it. And a lot of our ornamental fungicides are not general fungicides. Uh, there are ones that will not work for seed or apple rust. So, you know, one of the other rules of reading the labels, make sure the plant you're treating and the pest you're treating for is on that label. And you won't always find that for uh, seed or apple rust. So you got to be rather careful what you're going to end up going out there and spraying it with. But uh, again, now's the time to do the treatments. Oh, and one other point on treatments. And that is... Uh, try to avoid, no, avoid buying the general purpose fruit sprays. Uh, Rhoda might chat about this too tonight um, because the general purpose um, uh, pest sprays for fruit trees, they contain fungicides, which you do want to be spraying now, and they also contain insecticides, typically seven. And you do not want to be spraying insecticides on your apple or crab apple while they're in bloom. Uh, it's a good way to kill pollinators. Um, so, I, you know, to me, buy the chemical you need for what you need it for. Uh, general purpose sprays, while they may have a product in there that is needed by you now to treat something, they also have other chemicals in there that maybe you don't need to uh, spray. So be very cautious if you're going out and buying any of those. Oh, the other thing with cedar apple rust, people say, well, oh, I've got an apple tree in my yard. Will it infect it? Yes. How far? Um, actually, they keep lengthening in the distance, three, 400 feet easily. I've seen reports that say uh, that the spores can travel perhaps a mile or more. Uh, but definitely, if you've got a cedar tree within, uh, let's say, your own yard or your neighbor's yard that's producing these, and you've got an apple or crab apple that's susceptible, certainly the spores are going to reach that. So the old rule was try to separate them, but cedars are so common in our state that that's almost virtually impossible to do. Another little pest, I mean little, you're looking at a close-up of a leaf. This is an elm leaf. Hard to tell, isn't it? But if you really look close, you'll see a little trail going through that. Isn't that kind of cool? And you see the trail starts at that vein along the, the middle. This is the European elm flea weevil. Uh, it's a little insect that entered the United States uh, about uh, 15 or so years ago, I believe. Showed up in Chicago and then showed up in Hot Springs. How's that? So it jumped the whole eastern part of the state. Now it's found throughout South Dakota. And it loves Siberian elm, what a lot of people call Chinese elm uh, in our state. And it also will go after the hybrid elms that have uh, uh, the Siberian elm in its heritage. But right now, uh, the eggs were laid by the adults and the eggs are beginning to hatch and you'll find those little worms in there. And they're gonna feed inside the leaf. So it'll get kind of this brown blotchiness and pupate in there, form a little cocoon. The adults will come out and then adults will feed on the leaves too. So you got an elm tree with a lot of little holes by the end of the season or a lot of blotchiness to it. Uh, that's due to this European elm uh, flea weevil. Uh, and it's just about to displace the, uh, uh, the elm leaf beetle. Uh, and so a lot of our damage we see on elms nowadays, particularly our Siberian elms, is actually due to this insect. And they can almost completely defoliate them uh, by late summer. Oh, and this is my night for elms. The other thing you'll notice, and this is more on the American elms, the ground beneath some American elms is literally littered with twigs. It looks like fall, except the leaves are still attached to the twig. And you pick up one of these, and it was chewed off. It didn't just fall. This is squirrels. Squirrels nip the tips of elm trees, some years more than others. And why they do it, we don't know. They're squirrels. It's what they do. But they'll go out there and just nip these. And literally, you're going to go out there and rake for a couple of days. Uh, and then they quit. Seems to be in the spring at this time of year. Uh, maybe just to aggravate us or something. Uh, but then there's been a variety of theories as to why they do this. I think it's just to aggravate us because uh, it seems to occur more in nice yards. But uh, yeah, you'll find them. And, and every one on the, the end will look like it's just 
perfectly cut off, as you see here, but they're only going to do it for a couple of weeks and then you won't have to rake anymore. But isn't that a fun little problem you're going to have? And I've got to mention this. I just have to mention this. Uh, today, even I was getting calls. My Arborvitae, they're turning brown. Yes, everyone's Arborvitae is turning brown. Uh, I've uh, probably almost everybody because I've been getting calls and you see this everywhere in the state. Uh, they're brown. Typically the South side is a little browner than others. Some cases, it's the Northwest side where you get the wind, winds hitting it, uh, that are a little browner ones that are growing out in the open rather than a protected location are a little browner. But the thing that everybody says, almost everybody says is when I say, well, you know, that's winter desiccation injury. Uh, it was a dry fall. These plants dried out and they browned out. Now that tissue's dead. And they said, no, no, it can't be. It was green up till two weeks ago. As I mentioned last time, the Christmas tree that we set up has sat outside until the spring and it stayed green this whole time too. And it had no roots. So the fact that they didn't brown out until quite recently doesn't mean that the damage just happened. Uh, it was this, it was always there. It's just now that the plants are turning green and coming out of dormancy, it becomes very, very noticeable. Unfortunately, there's nothing you can do other, other than shear off what's brown. And if enough green is there, keep the plant. If not, well, you're starting over. We have this happen periodically. I think the last real one this bad was probably 89. I think it was, and I was working in Minnesota at the time and they had that, but uh, Green Giant, uh, Techni, a lot of them, I have not seen a lot of problems with Rushmore Arborvitae, I will have to say. Rushmore was developed at South Dakota State University and seems to be a very tough Arborvitae, but otherwise this seems to be everywhere on many, many, many different cultivars of this. Uh, though I haven't seen it again on Rushmore or the other one I haven't seen on it is Mr. Bowling Ball. You gotta love that name. Mr. Bowling Ball seems to be doing pretty good too. Well, and that brings me to the end here. And that is our real problem we're seeing this year. And we've seen in past years. It's not that our winter was cold. It wasn't that cold this year. It's just our climate's kind of wacky. Uh, we have a warm time period and then suddenly it gets cold again. And in the fall, we'll have it get cold, then it'll get warm again. And so our temperature fluctuations are the major factor in determining performance, winter performance for a lot of our woody plants. It would be a lot better if it just gradually got cold and gradually got warm and we had moisture. In other words, we live somewhere else. But here we don't. So just a tip for tonight, if you're looking to go out and buy a tree in the spring to plant, one of the things you might want to consider are plants that wake up late and go to bed early. In other words, plants that in the fall go dormant fairly soon, so they're a little bit more protected from these temperature extremes, and plants that come out of dormancy a little bit later. And one that is one of my favorites is yellowwood. And yellowwood is a, is a wonderful tree native to Ohio. And this is a picture of one in Mitchell, South Dakota. Uh, it's not for everywhere in the state. Uh, you wouldn't want to be growing it much farther north than uh, 212. So Aberdeen, I'm afraid you can't plant this, nor, nor can lemon. But a lot of the other areas can. And by the way, it tolerates our alkaline soils. But it is a gorgeous tree. Uh, quite often missed in garden centers. Why? Because people go in the garden center, hasn't even leafed out yet. They just started leafing out uh, this last week. And very quickly now they're going to bloom. And I love the flowers. They have long panicles, these white flowers that are incredibly fragrant. And they'll be out for about another week or so. Now, sometimes they're in full bloom at the very end of May. This year, it looks like more like the beginning of June. And they shut down in the fall. They have yellow fall color and then shut down early October. So this is a plant you really have from about May through September. But it's also one we don't see a lot of winter injury due to temperature fluctuations. Uh, the other one I'll mention, and everyone knows, or most of you know, this is one of my favorites, that's Kentucky coffee tree. Same thing. It just started leafing out about a week ago or so. 
and it'll drop its leaves in October. So, you know, rather short time period uh, for us, but nevertheless, we do not see the problems with temperature fluctuations that we do, for example, on maples, uh, call after call on maples this year, uh, because they broke bud fairly early. And the last slide I'll show is one that people don't think about, but uh, coffee trees do flower and they're in bloom right now. And the uh, female trees, the ones that produce uh, pistolate flowers. So in other words, you have some trees produce pistolate flowers, female trees, we call them, and some trees that produce only the male flowers, staminate flowers. But the uh, pistolate flowers are for the guys not, but uh, for the um, uh, female trees, they're very fragrant. Now, a lot of you are never going to be able to smell that. Why? Because we plant a lot of male trees because nobody likes the uh, bean pods to this tree. Uh, but we have a few. We got a couple on campus, for example. And there's a street in Sturgis that's lined with them. And at this time of year, you walk down that street, it's just a very nice light fragrance. So there's two tree choices. If you're still looking to go out and buy a tree and plant it, seems like we have nice moist weather, cool weather for at least another week. It might not be a bad time to go out and get a tree. But uh, if you're looking for something that can tolerate our temperature fluctuations, our crazy falls and our crazy springs, which contribute mo to most of our winter injury on woody plants, uh, yellow wood and Kentucky coffee tree are some darn good choices. Uh, so with that, I will stop sharing and turn it back over to Rhoda. We have a couple of questions for you, John. Will oh, there, sure. Let's do that. Will there be information in the local papers if the ash beetle, I presume the boar, gets to Yankton County? Yes. Um, and, and I'm probably going to be down there another week looking again for it. Considering we have, uh, we have it in Sioux Falls, we know in Canton and that, and we also know it's in uh, what... Uh, Grand Island and also Omaha, you're, you're kind of in the middle. Um, it's got to be down there or down there very soon. So absolutely, any new county fine gets very well publicized. And the reason for that is any new county fine means we're setting a quarantine. So if we found it down in Yankton, for example, uh, one, I have to confirm it that yes, it is Emerald Ashmore. When we find it, then there'll be a state quarantine that nothing can move out of that county that has ash. Why? Because we don't want to spread it as fast. So that's a good question. But uh, absolutely, any county other than Lincoln and Minnesota that we find in, there'll be a lot of information out about that. And the other question we could probably share, it's a question about my apple tree in hot springs didn't bloom at all this spring. We did get it fertilized this spring, but that was the only thing we did different. We never even saw any buds. And now I'm assuming they didn't see any flower buds. It, it right. leafed out, right? I, okay. I presume. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because if there's nothing, then we call right. that dead. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, but well, I'll start with that, and then you can you can take it, Rhoda. But I mean, one thing that I've noticed is, um, you know, we do have trees that are alternate bearing, and quite often when I talk with people on something like this, they say, "Well, yeah, last year it had a lot of flowers and it had a lot of fruit." Well, this year you won't, and some trees are more prone to that than others. Um, and some of our more popular ones, and correct me if I'm wrong, Rhoda, but I think even Honeycrisp can be an alternate bearer in some cases, but I know Haroldson was. Uh, and so uh, Haroldson was very easy to have an on year and an off year. And uh, quite often you'll find varieties will mention whether or not they're an alternate bearer. So let's hope it was that. Uh, if they had a large crop last year, this year, it's, it's the off year, but that's my thoughts. Uh, your thoughts, Rhoda. My only other thought is is uh, some of the wacky temperatures we had out here in the West this early, late winter and early spring, whether it might have taken out some buds. Uh, sometimes depending upon the timing of the, of the freeze, it will 
kill the flower buds, petals and all. Sometimes they come out and you have petals, but but the insides, the rest of it is dead. So you can you can sometimes have blossom, but no fruit. <laughs> so, but this was no blossom at all. As far as the fertilizer, you know, those buds for fruit or flowering this year, the spring, were set last year, uh, during the summer last year. So fertilizer this spring probably didn't have anything to do with it. No, and, and it wouldn't, nor would have it have helped it. Fertilizing the spring wasn't going to suddenly make it flower. Um, and, and, you know, that, uh, the only thing I'll mention with that is most people, many people, I should say, when I say, well, here's your problem with the tree, or here's your problem with the shrub, or, or I'll say even, boy, it needs water. And it's amazing how people jump to fertilize. Well, can I fertilize it instead? Well, it needs water. How about if I just fertilize it? Well, it has, what if I just fertilize it? <laughs> fertilizer, fertilizer is not chicken soup. All right. You don't fertilize something to make it healthy. We fertilize healthy plants to keep them healthy, assuming they are lacking the elements that you're fertilizing it with. Um, so fertilizer, why can be beneficial. And it's certainly helpful for woody plants and, and for gardens, I'll let somebody else talk about, but it's not a cure uh, for a lot of our, a lot of our problems. So uh, enough said on, on that, but I see fertilizer too often prescribed for just about everything, including male pattern baldness, and it doesn't work for me. <laughs> uh, Jody mentions last year it had some blooms, but frost hit it. So the, I don't know what variety you have. Maybe it blooms too early or something, but. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I would go with that too, because. Other. Yeah, if it, uh, if it didn't bloom last year, that wouldn't have caused the alternate bearing then. Uh, you're right. I, I mean, in hot springs, I've seen it where you get the honey locust starting to leaf out and they're hit right at that time. Um, hot spring is a place for woody plants go when they did something bad in a previous life <laughs> because you are subjected to uh warm days and cold days and they're only a day apart so <laughs> it's it, it is a tough place to be a woody plant or sometimes only 12 hours apart <laughs> yeah good point <laughs> uh, if a tree has not budded out yet and they were planted last summer we have river birch maple and princeton elm how long do we wait before we give up on it? You know, I, I'm going to tell you wait a couple more weeks. And, and my reasoning for that is I've seen a lot of maples that are very slow or of leafing out. And I've seen that with river birch too, not so much with elm. Uh, but I can remember a number, and that's the thing about being old, you can always remember. But I can remember one year, some things did not break bud till the 4th of July. Uh, I remember looking at a couple of trees in uh, Sioux Falls, for example, fairly large trees. One was a catalpa, still there. And it was sitting there a third week of June, had not broke bud yet, and then finally did. But this weather went warm and cold and that. So if the buds are still plump, and if you scrape the twig and it's still green underneath. Oh, and I have seen this with Japanese tree lilacs too. Same thing. They're being very slow and kind of spread give them a few more weeks um you know they're just having a hard time waking up this year somebody's hoping with climate change they will get pecans on their pecan trees in yankton you know what you don't even need climate change for that <laughs> uh there's a pecan tree in sioux falls that actually produces pecans occasionally and i'm not going to disclose its location but uh <laughs> Uh, yeah, Yankton and uh, down there in North Sioux City and that, there are them. And, you know, there, and they asked the right question or gave the right answer. And that is they're hardy farther north. There's one growing in Fargo, but it's not warm enough long enough for them to develop the, uh, the nut. So you're right. For that, we need a little bit more global warming. By that, we need a longer, warmer growing season to really be able to produce good pecans. So, gee, maybe there's a plus side to becoming an oven. Uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, it seems like it's just becoming more erratic, not necessarily a longer season. <laughs> 
you know what you're you know what you're absolutely right because i get the other question people say well with all this warming we should be able to grow coconut palms or something else <laughs> and and i show them that yes our winters are often not as cold as they used to be but we still get the cold ones you know and and it's just it's more erratic now you know life was better when i was a kid <laughs> right <laughs> Uh, we had one more question. I'm going to take this one. Uh, before you leave tonight, please touch on rehabilitating newly planted gardens. Actually, some of this could come into the woody plants too. Shredded by hailstorms this afternoon. I am in the hills uh, and we're sending it east. Uh, so yeah, we had in town a marble-sized hail or a little smaller maybe. Uh, but as far as as tender plants like like your garden transplants and and so forth don't get too bent out of shape uh, for a few days wait a few days because it's amazing how many plants can sort of bounce back put out new leaves uh, i'd probably give it a week before unless you know it's it's sheared off right at, at ground level um, but if you still have some sticks with maybe a leaf or two, that plant might recover and send out new leaves. So, so uh, don't give up on them yet. Uh, sort of the thing tonight, I guess, is don't give it up, give up on it quite yet. And I don't know if John wants to drop drop in with the, any defoliation on woody plants. I, kind of the same thing, Rhoda. Uh, if you've lost a lot of leaves on your plant, the only thing I would suggest is that one, be patient. It'll set, a, it'll produce a new set of leaves. But also, if it goes dry to water, even if it doesn't have leaves, it still needs water. So uh, it's amazing how well plants can recover from something like this. So patience and watering are probably the two things I'd recommend. Okay. And I am going to go ahead and share some information here. I got a question uh, through the email today that was sent into the hotline, I believe. And a woman wrote in and said her stems last year, these are actually tomato stems on the right. Uh, and you see all those little dots on it. And she was concerned that the galls that are over on the linden, uh, that these insects had actually uh, colonized her tomato as well. And uh, I'll, I'll leave John to talk about linden galls, but uh, on the tomato, these are not actually insects. These are little baby roots on the plant. You've probably seen them on a normal tomato plant. There's just little bumps. But sometimes when the plant gets stressed for some reason, they'll start to develop because the plant thinks it needs it to save itself. And so it's, it's pulling out all stops, <laughs> literally. Um, and so that can happen with herbicide injury, 2,4-D uh, drift can do this. If that were the case, you'd probably notice uh, curled up leaves. Um, then if you have curled up leaves along with this, you can probably blame the herbicide on it. You can occasionally get it, usually not quite this drastically, but uh, with uneven watering, if the plant dried out too much, or maybe you went back and forth between too much water and too little water, and it's the plant is having trouble uh, processing that, uh, it may decide that it, it needs to save itself. Uh, this person also mentioned that the leaves were were browning and that this was probably not the cause of the leaves browning but rather the stress that was also causing the leaves to brown uh, made the plant decide you know i'm going to try to save myself uh, once in a while if you're planting uh tomatoes real close together and they're crowded, you may end up with something like this too, where, where they're trying to, they're not, not getting enough nutrients or, or not getting enough sunshine. So they're just sort of saying, 
I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to save myself. <laughs> and so, so you get this really bizarre uh, looking stem, but but that's the reason for that. And uh, John, if you want to chat any about the linden tree, feel free to to pop in. Yeah, I'll just very quickly. That's not an insect either. Uh, it's actually a mite. Uh, that causes those small little bumps. They feed on the underside, and then as they're feeding, uh, what they're injecting into the linden causes these little galls to form around them. It's kind of like building their own house that they're eating in. Uh, it does not harm the plant at all. That leaf is manufacturing as much food with the galls as if it didn't have the galls interesting enough. So it makes the leaves look a little poor and, and there's nothing you can do about it either. I mean, people say, well, can I spray? No, the goal's already there. <laughs> um, and, and there's really no need to either. It's uh, kind of a curiosity rather than a problem. Will they go to other plants besides Linda? Actually, no, they won't. Now, again, there's other urtified mites that feed on other plants. There's one on, uh, box elder, for example, one on maple uh, and that, but they're very host specific. In other words, if you like lindens, you're pretty much stuck in your rut. Uh, you're only going to feed on lindens, even if another maple leaf's right in there. So uh, they're, they're, they're not going to jump from one plant to the next. In fact, what's interesting, they become so finely attuned to their host. Sometimes they won't move from one linden to another linden. So it's, it's, <laughs> Common to see one tree affected and the other one not. <laughs> All right. Uh, I mentioned last week that I was going to start doing a series on companion planting. Uh, this week's uh, subject was cucumbers with garlic, onion, or wheat, another monocot. These are all monocots. Um, and they found that planting these, interplanting, or maybe one row of each, uh, increase the cucumber yield. Uh, and when they looked at why might that be, they found the increased diversity and activities of those microbes in the soil that are inhabiting the plant roots in the, the root area, and found decreased soil fungal pathogens. Less fusarium, for example, on the on the cucumbers for at least two seasons afterwards. So this is another example of uh, companion planting that, that we have have some actual test results in, in looking at what, what might be behind it. And then finally, the last thing I'm going to talk about today is another uh, picture that was sent in to me this week. Uh, this is a grape. And as you can see, it's got uh, very dark green veins and chlorosis between the veins, between the veins uh, to the point that it's even dying. Uh, we've even got some dead tissue. Now, the first thing we always think of with master gardeners with, with green veins is uh, chlorosis, iron chlorosis, that it's high pH soil, it's the plants having trouble getting iron into the leaves. But that's probably not the case with this particular leaf. Look how fine uh, those fine veins are also uh, green. And when we've got all those little network of veins that are staying green, it more often is a, is a micronutrient that the plant is missing, uh, zinc and or manganese, which is a minor element that both of those can have trouble being tied up in high, high pH soils. In this case, this grape was actually growing in a container with an artificial soil and so uh, just wasn't able to get the nutrients that it needed. So this is not a disease in this case, or a, a pathogen in this case, uh, it's a lack of nutrients. Yeah, let's see. I think that's it for our questions. Uh, again, I want to remind you, and you've seen this in the chat too, so you can click on any of those and, and bookmark it for future questions. Uh, 
you're welcome to email or call uh, with emails. You're welcome to submit questions and pictures. And uh, we will, if, if our staff at these centers uh, can't answer them, they usually shoot them up to us and you may see them on the garden hotline uh, next week. So with that, I will stop sharing and I want to thank Amanda and John for joining me tonight. And I want to thank all our audience tonight for joining us. And again, if your question wasn't answered during the show tonight, you can submit it online or come back next week and we will see you again next week for Garden Hotline. Have a good week.